<clears throat> okay, I apologize. I've been having some technical issues. <clears throat> Dan, Juanita, are y'all there? Oh, there you are. Dan, can you hear me? Hey, Dan, can you hear me? Oh, I can, Joe. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, I was having some technical issues this evening, and so I was trying to figure out what was going on. Well, let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer this evening. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and to <clears throat> use technology to meet, and I pray that you would... Use this time that it would be uplifting and encouraging to us all. And uh, I pray that you would lead us and guide us toward becoming a, a church that looks after not just the, not just ourselves, not just the, world, but that uh, we look after, uh, after those who are not yet uh, members of our church. And so uh, help us to reach out to guests and love them and show them the love of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you fix it? All right, so tonight we are talking about uh, chapter four of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Becoming a Welcoming Church study. Uh, this week we are discussing the idea of a safe and clean church. And so what I want us to do first is look at the book of Colossians chapter three, verse 23 to start off with. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, which says this. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. So we uh, need to make sure that whatever we're doing, we do it for the Lord's glory and not for our own. And uh, it's interesting that this is in the section where he's talking about the, the way wives and, and husbands are to relate to one another and the way that slaves are to obey their human masters. This is all in that same uh, section here, but he says, whatever you do, don't be people pleasers, but be pleasers of the Lord. And so with that being said, um, one of the ways that we try to do that is by honoring the Lord with the way we interact with one another, uh, with, with guests. Tom Rainer records uh, this story uh, of when he was first pastor at a church. Uh, he went in to, to go preach. He was voted in. They only had, I think he said, seven members in the church when he started. And so he uh, he went to the to the the people that the the like the chairman of the deacons basically, and said, "Hey, uh, this is kind of an odd question, but uh, where's the bathroom?" <laughs> and uh, they said, uh, "We don't have one." And he said, "What?" 
What do you mean you don't have a bathroom? Where do you tell guests when they come and, and they need to know where the bathroom is? And they said, well, we don't have any of those either. And so uh, they weren't expecting guests. They weren't ready for guests. They didn't have the facilities uh, for guests. And so uh, tonight we're going to be talking a little bit more about the idea of facilities and how we keep our facilities cleaned and ready to, ready to go. But what tends to happen for most of us <clears throat> is that as we see the same thing frequently, we pass by it, uh, we, we don't notice it. And then all of a sudden we turn around and it's really bad. For instance, uh, our sink had a little, uh, it was having some trouble draining and we, you know, had, had not really noticed how bad it was uh, until it got to the point that it wouldn't drain at all. And uh, so then we had to go to the store, get some Drano and, and try to correct the issue. Uh, Rainer tells of a story of how he went to see his mom and would, every time he'd go to see his mom at their house uh, or at her house, uh, he would notice that there was some paint peeling or there was, uh, there was some other issue that needed some maintenance. And she just never noticed it because she saw it every day. Uh, but he would notice it and mention it to her and then they would be able to correct the issue. But when you see the same thing frequently, whether it be every day uh, at your house or every week when you go to the church, you're not as apt to notice it. And so we have to examine our facilities to see if they say, hey, come in, you're welcome here, or if they communicate that we don't care. So we want to make sure that we're taking notice. Now, so we first thing I want us to talk about tonight is the safe church. Um, it, it's important that we have a church that is uh, physically safe. Uh, there is a, a checklist that uh, Tom Rainer uh, has provided with this book. I will include that uh, in the notes in just a moment. Or if Chelsea can do that for me, I, she can do that. Um, but there, there's a checklist that's provided by him. There's also one that's provided by a, an insurance company that I have also uh, downloaded and, and will make available. Uh, Chelsea, those are both in my Dropbox if you're able to share those. Um, and so it's important that we evaluate our church building, our church grounds to make sure that it is a safe place uh, for all guests uh, that are coming in and all members. And so I think we do a pretty good job at this, but uh, I, I think we can always look to improve upon that. And so this is one of the ways we can do so. so Chelsea will put that in the, in the um, chat in just a moment. Uh, but as she's doing that, I want us to move on to talking about the safe church in general to specifically the safe church and children. Because few people think that it will happen. Most people don't will say nothing is going to happen in our church with our children, but negligence and child abuse does take place in our churches. And so the protection of our children is more than just an issue of guest friendliness. It, it is absolutely necessary, but it, it does relate to guests because if you look at statistics, those that are millennials, I'm a millennial, those that were born 1980 to the year 2000, uh, we're the largest generation in American history. And while it's true that only one-fourth attend church, uh, most all of them have children. Uh, and so they, when they come to church, they bring with them their children. And th those children are called the iGen, the iGeneration. Uh, they're, they're used to smartphones and, and technology, uh, and they're not like the older generations. Uh, I remember when I was younger, my mom would send us out in the yard and close the door and we'd be out there for hours and she'd call us in around mealtime and we'd come in and eat and then we'd go back outside and play some more. You know, climbing trees out in the pasture, trying to break my arm all the time. Uh, you know, that, that was just part of life for me as a kid. And I'm sure probably for you as well. Um, whether it be you know riding your bike down the road or going out and playing in the street or you know, whatever, uh, that was just part of our culture. But the iGen are not like these older generations like us. They're accustomed to having constant safety concerns and constant 
supervision. Uh, and so the church must demonstrate that we're a safe place, that we're a secure place, and that we're a sanitary place. And also with that being said, not only do we have to worry about the physical safety, but we also have to be concerned about safety from sexual predators because child sex abuse in the church has been the number one issue of legislation that relates to churches for more than the last two decades, more than 20 years. Uh, the number one issue of legislation regarding churches. More parents than ever are highly sensitive to the issue and they should be. It is something that should be of a concern for everybody. And so if, if the church brushes this issue aside, not only does it deserve to not have any guests, but it deserves to not have any children attending either. And, and the sad situation with that is that's, that's, the, that's the church. Uh, we like to talk about that that's the future of the church, but our children are part of our church. And so if we don't, if we don't take care of them, we don't deserve to have them. So let's talk briefly about some precautions for working with children. So this is regardless of the size of the church, says there should be some certain rules for those who work with children. And I agree with all of the things that are on this list. Um, it's not a comprehensive list, but it does cover the basics. Um, and so churches need to explain clearly and powerfully how we protect children uh, on, on our website. We need to show how we do it uh, when we're talking about our, our activities that we have for children. How do we protect them? And Tom Rainer says it's as important to have this information on your church website as it is to have the location and the times of service. And so uh, we need to come up with a, a written rule uh, for those that work with our children. And right now our church is poised uh, to be able to do this well, because at the moment, the only person we have working with the children is, uh, is Nicole King. And so we can put some of these in place while we are, are looking for more volunteers to work with our children. So here's some basic precautions. First of all, anyone who works with children should be required to be a member of the church for an established length of time. So we need to determine what that length of time is and put that in writing that if you're going to be working with children, you have had to have been with the church for a certain amount of time. Second of all, all children's workers should complete a written application. Um, I know very few churches who, do, who have done this. Um, this is one of those things that I instituted though uh, in, in uh, Morris when I was youth minister there. Anybody who was going to work with the youth that I was in charge of were required to complete a written application and, uh, and abide by the rules that were set forth in it, or they would be removed from their volunteer position. And so I was concerned about making sure that, that they were um, safe and taken care of. Uh, and so I required that anybody who was going to be a volunteer working with my youth group at Morris had to complete a written application and, uh, and uh, agree to abide by that. And so it's a good thing to do. Uh, we need to do that with all of our children's workers as well. Anybody who's going to be working with children needs to be interviewed by uh, the deacons. And so uh, we can need to uh, make sure to plan for that. Everyone who works with children should be subject to reference checks. We need to have some references to say uh, that they're worthy to, uh, that they're okay to work with children. I need to have a criminal background check and national sex offender registry check as well. So part of that can be in with that written application of uh, providing the information that's needed for that as well as signing off uh, on that. Also, the church should maintain records for all children's workers. So once we have the, the written paperwork uh, and all of the reference checks and everything, uh, put that in a file and maintain that. Uh, have ongoing training for volunteers and staff. Uh, we need to 
uh, so sadly, uh, many times churches uh, and, and especially smaller churches have people who've worked with the kids for forever. And so they go, well, I know everything that I need to know. But uh, I'm, I agree with the Lowe's philosophy, never stop improving. <laughs> Always keep training, learning more on how you could, could do it better. And so especially for someone who's just coming on to work with children, uh, we need to provide that training for them. I need to have a clear response plan to protect victims uh, of all applicable laws in the event that there is an incident. We need to have a plan in place. Here's what's gonna happen in the event that something takes place. And so uh, <clears throat> need to have that written out and communicated well in the event that something were to happen, this is the steps that would be taken. And this one's very important. Um, we, we don't have any at the moment, but any off-campus small groups, and we did this at, at, uh, at Warner, we had small groups in homes, but if you're gonna have small groups in homes, you have to have someone to work with the children and you have to have that same guideline for there as at the church, uh, because there was a, a church that did not do this uh, that is now in a, uh, in a legal battle because something happened at one of those homes. And so we need to be, be careful that if we do anything offsite, uh, anybody who's doing any of that should fall under these same guidelines. Welcome, Richard. Good to see you. You're muted. Yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> um, you know, anytime you're trying to get on in a hurry, you're, uh, and your, your computer's never going to boot up quickly. That's right. Uh, well, we had some trouble getting started this, this evening. Um, it kept showing that I was already in a meeting. Oh, no. So it was causing some issues, but we got it figured out. I'm glad you were able to join with us anyway. Okay, uh, so we, we talked about the, the safe church, um, but now let's, let's talk about the sloppy church. Um, Rainer interviewed um, a, a guy and he asked why he didn't come back to this church and, and uh, he said this, the church looked like it was a disorganized yard sale. There were Bibles laying everywhere, including in the bathroom uh, there were a few dozen people who uh, apparently had forgotten their umbrellas and their coats and just left them lying wherever they, they left them. Uh, and he says, and, and then there were the upright pianos. Now, to my knowledge, we don't have this issue, uh, but many churches have several old, ugly, unused upright pianos that just are stored wherever they can find room. I know this was the case at, at Mary Nibla growing up. There were upright pianos everywhere. Uh, that people had donated. Uh, and so and Rainer said I was, he was talking about this issue uh, with, with a group and someone in the group sent a photo from their church of an upright piano that was being stored in the men's restroom. So he said, listen, it, this is just a sloppy church. That, that was this, this guy's thought when he asked, what was the deal? Why did you not return to the church? And he said, my first impression of the church was that it was sloppy. So I walked in and there was stuff just everywhere. There were things that were old, uh, laying around. He says, uh, I don't think I'm going to return because, and sadly, a lot of churches look like they're just not anticipating guests or, or they don't like guests. And, um, Last night we had some some friends come over and so we spent time before they came over making sure to tidy up and get everything ready uh, because we don't want to look like a bunch of slobs and so we need to do the same thing as a church you know look and see what are some things that maybe make us look like we're sloppy and so here were some common church observations not saying that these necessarily apply all of them to us but here are some observations First of all, uh, a lot of churches have clutter. That is basically storage for what members either did not want at their house 
And so they just dropped off at the church and said, oh, the church, church can use this or stuff that they just forgot. And so uh, I'm always, clutter bother, bothers me. So I'm kind of always on the lookout for clutter and trying to clean it up anyways. So I, uh, I went through the other day and got all the um, old Sunday school material from last quarter that was still on the pews and, and put that away in the Sunday school office just because I was tired of looking at it. And so, uh, but I, I don't like having clutter and I know a lot of people, uh, if they walk in and see stuff like that, uh, that drives them as crazy as it does me. Uh, scarcity of trash cans. A uh, guy said uh, he came in, he, was, he had a cup of coffee that he had stopped at the store and got as he was coming to church and he was going to throw it away when he got into the church. And he ended up leaving with it because he couldn't find a church, a, a trash can anywhere in the church. And so uh, make sure that there are trash cans around uh, that can be found. <laughs> Uh, so that we don't have that kind of a situation and don't have people just gathering trash and, or just leave it even worse, leaving it in the sanctuary, just on the floor or whatever. Uh, odors said a lot of, uh, a lot of churches have some musty odors and uh, there's been some times when I've walked in and went, whew, something smells funky in here. Usually it's because there was a dead mouse somewhere. Uh, so I usually try to turn on the fan, but uh, a lot of churches, they, they don't even worry about it. That's just, that's just the way our church smells. And so uh, we don't want to be one of those. Unstocked restrooms. Um, no one likes to need toilet paper and not be able to find it. <laughs> so uh, we want to make sure that we keep it stocked. Uh, and I think Nicole does a great job at that. Uh, but Tom uh, Rayner, record a story of a guest uh, that came in and they went in the bathroom and he, every stall was out of toilet paper. And so uh, she went back out to her husband and said, I've got to go to the bathroom. There's not any toilet paper in here. So they left. And instead of going to church that day, they went to McDonald's because that was the nearest place they could find with a bathroom. Uh, next is paper signage. Um, a lot of you can have paper signs and they look nice, especially if you print them on a uh, nicer quality paper. But I think personally, it's more important what's on the paper than what's, uh, what type of paper it is. And uh, so he said, you know, that there were some signs that were put around the church that if they were put around in my office building, uh, we would, they would be taken down immediately. They're not acceptable uh, because of, poor grammar or, or just a, a being a rude type of uh, note. And so he said, you know, take, take that and, and do away with that. And then out of date information, um, things like Sunday school material that's, that's out of date, things like um, events, uh, promotions that are, that are past. He, and he, I think I mentioned about the Easter service a, a few weeks ago that, it was November and they were promoting the Easter service still on their bulletin board that had been in April or March. Uh, and so it, it's, we just, if it's something that's out of date, it just needs to go away and be thrown away, taken care of. Uh, a couple of other things that I really haven't noticed in our church, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, but dirty carpet, faded paint and torn and dirty pew cushions uh, were a large reason why a lot of people did not return to their, um, to those churches. And then the last one was poor lighting. And he said, you know, if there's too much light, then it, it hurts your eyes. But if there's not enough light, especially with uh, the way a lot of churches are built, uh, they have a darker wood, uh, they have a, uh, a different kind of light that, um, just naturally makes it have more of a, a warm light. And so it, if it's, if one's burned out or, or whatever, it, and it's a little dark, then it starts to feel gloomy and depressing. And so they don't want to return. Uh, so that's some observations. Here's the main thing I, I want to get to is what, what do we need as far as from us, our mentality 
to do well uh, as being a safe and a clean church. And, and Rainer says, listen, there's no relationship between the size of the church and the safety and cleanliness of the church. There's been large churches that he's been in that, that had these problems. There's been small churches that had these problems. There's been small ones that have taken great pride in making sure everything was nice. There's been uh, large ones that also do that. So it's not, not a matter of size, but it's a matter of perspective of right attitude and right effort. It, it's a, uh, a fact that you need to see it from, from a gospel perspective. Um, understanding that many guests that come into the church are not followers of Christ. And so we want to allow opportunities for them to hear and respond to the gospel. And if they come in and, and the facilities are so distracting that they can't come in and, and hear the gospel, then understand that, that that's a gospel issue. And so we, we want to make sure we look at that as what it is, a gospel issue. Also, <clears throat> these safe and clean churches find champions. They find people who are passionate, people who are accountable about uh, the ministry uh, of the church, and, and they want to make sure that this is being taken care of. Um, <clears throat> notice the, the third one there, focus, uh, focus on cleanliness, safety, and security. Um, and, and not just one person doing this, but finding someone for each of those areas, somebody who's focused on the cleanliness of the church, someone who's focused on making sure that the church is safe, someone who's focused on making sure that it's secure. And so uh, finding champions for each area. The next one is the check up uh, that they use the, the checklist. Chelsea, did you get those posted? Um, when I allow you? Okay. I'll get those here in, in a moment, see if it'll <laughs> let me to do it. If not, I will print those out and bring them Sunday. Uh, but some checklist uh, to go through and it says, you, you know, you need to go through these at least once a year, but it's even better if you do it more frequently. So if you can do it for once a quarter or even once a month, go through this uh, quickly and address any issues. Uh, the, the next to the last one there, listen, uh, talking about scheduling a secret guest to come at least once a year. And of course it'll, it'll be need to be someone who's not known by uh, pretty much anybody in the church, but just come in and, and attend a service and, and go through all the building and make sure that it's uh, feel safe, look safe, is safe, uh, clean, and secure. Um, have them check for ways to improve, and when there's actions suggested to improve, uh, to act on them. Uh, I really like this last one because I don't think a lot of churches do this, but it's called uh, it's check out, check out other churches. And he said, uh, th there's some churches that they've gone through, and he said, you need to set up some ambassadors that go out to other churches every six to nine months and come back with suggestions on how we can improve uh, in our facilities here. <clears throat> now, one thing we can't, um, if we're talking about safety, we can't men go without mentioning the fear of church shootings. Um, here in, in Fort Worth, there was a church not that long ago. Uh, there's a church um, not far from where we're located here that was um, that experienced a church shooting about 20 years ago. They um, had the anniversary service for that um, several months ago, and, and there was a book that I purchased uh, from that that talks about how to respond in the aftermath and how God's grace showed through. But, um, but it, it's, it's seriously a fear in, in our culture, maybe not so much in Mansville where pretty much everybody's packing, but, um, but in, in places that like Fort Worth and, and I was concerned about it when I was at Mill Creek because we were really not far from the highway uh, that you know, somebody just decided to stop and, and shoot up a church, we were right there. Uh, and so how do we address this? What, what plan does the church have in this, in the event of this type of situation, and how is that communicated to our guests and members? Uh, so we need to have a plan in place for that as well. 
And the point being that if a, if a church really cares, then we'll strive to be safe, we'll strive to be clean, we'll strive to be secure, because it's, it's not a matter of money. Uh, we, I, I don't think money is really an issue for us anyways, uh, but it's, it's really not a money issue. It's, a, it's an issue of commitment and execution. And really, you, you save money by taking better care of your facilities rather than having to, to turn around and uh, do more costly repairs later on. But if the church is not a safe or a clean place, uh, our, as speaking of our building or facilities, it's not, it, it's a reflection of a lack of attention at best. But at worst, it's a lazy and uncaring attitude that tells members and guests that we just, we don't care uh, if it's, and it's not living up to that Colossians 3.23 mentality of, doing everything as if it were for the Lord and realizing that our facilities, we call it the Lord's house. And so we want to make sure that we're representing him well. All right. <clears throat> and to wrap up, here's some points to ponder. Um, how would you rate our church's cleanliness on a scale of one to 10? What are some improvements that we could make? Goodness, Maggie. Maggie. Can't even hear myself think. Uh, what are some improvements that we could make uh, if it's not a 10? Uh, I, I highly doubt that it's a 10. I don't score 10 on anything because there's always room for improvement. Um, how can cleanliness and safety be a gospel issue? We kind of talked about that already. Um, what do you think millennial parents expect of church facilities when they're bringing their children in? As someone who is approximately my age, 30s or so, 30s to 40s, uh, and how do we meet those expectations? And now I, I'm really curious on this next one. When was the last time our church had a thorough safety inspection? And if we were to have one now, what do you think the results would be? And then the final one there, how does Colossians 3.23 relate to the topics we covered in this chapter? Well, we've pretty much framed this in that idea Colossians 3.23, that we are to do all things for the glory of God, not to be people pleasers, but because we strive for the Lord's purpose. So Richard, uh, Dan, Juanita, y'all have any thoughts on anything before we wrap up? No, I don't have anything. All right, I think we're pressing close on the time, so I'm going to go ahead and pray and we'll close out. Um, I, I won't be there this Sunday evening, but my plan is uh, to do the last two sessions um, on Sunday nights, but I'll probably do a, a catch-up session uh, the first Sunday night that I'm there for those who have not been on, on the online uh, conversation. So just to kind of give you a heads up of where I'm thinking and heading towards. So uh, and then we won't do this on, uh, on Wednesday nights anymore. So. All right, well, let's pray and we will be uh, <coughs> evening. Father God, we thank you that we're able to, uh, to come together and to um, take pride in belonging to you and that our uh, facilities belong to you and are there for your purposes. God, help us to use them to glorify you and to do all things. Uh, wh whether it be in the church or in the world, and let us do all for the glory of your name and let us do to the best of our ability as we strive to present you as you truly are. Uh, amazing, wonderful, and beyond description. So, Father God, I pray that you would empower us with your spirit to go on and, and to live lives of holiness, proclaiming your praises. We pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Thank y'all for joining, and we'll see you guys Sunday morning. Uh, now, I don't know if you got word, Joe, but I, Nicole and I will not be there Sunday. We're, okay. we're, we're going out of town for our anniversary. All right. Well, happy anniversary. Thank you. We'll Thank see you, you uh, next week then. All right. All right. Y'all have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.